how do you create that kind of regulation, especially internationally? Part of it is these international agreements, which it were front and center in Dubai. Part of it is just political will at the national or subnational level to put in these regulations. A big factor that, or a couple of big factors uh, that are now making a difference are there has been a lot of uh, moral pressure, um, activist attention, government pressure for oil and gas companies. I don't think that'll motivate the Chinese Communist Party, moral pressure. Fair enough. Um, a lot of the oil majors globally, uh, more of them private than nationally owned companies, which which um, tend to be you know much less imper- much more impervious to outside political pressure. People who who care about the climate, who are putting pressure on these companies and making them look bad if they're if they're not taking care of their methane, this is getting them to voluntarily pledge now to reduce their methane, whether they have to do it from a regulatory standpoint or not. They're basically trying to get ahead of the regulations and ahead of public opinion to show that they are constructive actors on climate change. And regardless of their motives, it is critical that it get done. So it is very important that this methane get captured and not leak to the environment where it is uh, a climate uh, global warming agent and incidentally also a pretty nasty air pollutant. If you're if you're living nearby, and so that's happening. These these uh, oil and gas companies are getting religion on the need to to capture their methane. So they're now kind of doing it themselves. The last factor that's important is scientific observation. Uh, Earth observation has advanced pretty dramatically in recent years, such that there are a lot of new satellites in Earth orbit that can actually detect and measure methane sources on the ground such that no one can hide anymore, right? If you have some big oil field or some natural gas processing facility or pumping facility, if you are leaking a lot of methane, the satellite is going to see it in space. And so that is a bad headline waiting to happen. And that is another source of pressure now that well, people who care about political pressure, companies that care about political pressure uh, now are having to contend with. Whether that's going to happen in China is is anyone's guess. Ostensib- so China didn't uh, take on any binding commitments for methane, which was a, a weaker commitment than other countries have made or other companies have made, where they've specifically said, we're going to reduce it by a specific amount by 2030. But it, it was it was a landmark in that China made this commitment for the first time. China does capture some of its methane from these sources. They've just never committed to meeting some performance standard and some objective yardstick. But didn't they also water down some of the language at COP28, like from phasing out fossil fuels to uh, transitioning away from? You are in with the lingo. You really uh, uh, know know the COP28 documents. I tip my hat. It It's... I think a matter of some speculation, which countries in the hallways of the of the negotiations were behind the watering down of that language on moving away from fossil fuels, and it was phase out or phase down. We wound up with with uh, transitioning from over time. I think the speculation is that was more due to the major oil and gas producers of OPEC. But it is equally true that fossil fuels includes coal, and China is the 800-pound gorilla on coal globally. So it is entirely possible. I confess that I don't have insider knowledge as to who was behind that political pressure, but it's entirely possible. Well, so speaking of of OPEC and, you know, Middle Eastern uh, oil, like COP28 was held in Dubai which is part of the UAE and the United Arab Emirates is probably uses some of the highest per capita energy consumption of any country. And they got air conditioners running 24 seven, for example, they're also a massive oil producer. Uh, That's how basically they made all their money. Um, I mean, Dubai has 
some other commercial investments that they funded with oil money, but it's essentially oil money. Like, is this just kind of like a sad irony? Is it, is it like almost just like that cynical joke? There's no question the optics were pretty lousy. And not only was the UAE the host, the uh, actual chairperson of the COP process this year and the host for the, the year or the coming year is the one in charge of the process for the entire year leading up to it. So Sultan al Jaber is his name. And, you know, wait for it. He is... He runs the national oil company, Adnoc, of the United Arab Emirates. So it basically made heads explode all over the world in climate circles, particularly people who are um, environment and climate hawks, to uh, put the the fox in charge of the hen house, so to speak. Uh, I think there was a lot of question as to whether Sultan al-Jabbar was a good faith actor. And I don't think that that was ever completely resolved. Again, optics are horrific, um, that it's the oil companies calling the shots. That said, you really kind of can't hide if you are baldly and blatantly catering to the oil interests and not getting a climate deal. You, it would have been pretty foolhardy for them to just do a pure power play because the the, the diplomatic blowback would have been just uh, unbelievably ferocious. Right. So Whether, the ideal strategy then is to simply water things down as much as possible and still get an agreement that looks somewhat better than what there was before. That is entirely plausible. And reasonable, reasonable people disagree about whether it was the UAE putting its thumb on the scale or whether that was simply just the political dynamics behind the negotiations with all the other players. I, it's hard to say. We don't have a counterfactual. You know, if this had happened in Costa Rica or some other environmentally friendly country, would we have gotten a different outcome? We'll never know. I will say that a lot of people have given uh, Sultan al Jaber credit for including fossil fuels in the final agreement, the global stock take at all, which to some people is a, a real accomplishment and demonstrates his bona fides. But it's also a low bar though. Well, I think there, yes. I, it's really interesting actually seeing what the environmental community has said in reaction to the agreement because it really is a bit of a Rorschach test as to whether the observer believes that the UN international climate process is capable of achieving something and whether these incremental steps are leading us to a solution or just leading us off the cliff because we're not doing it. And I, you know, there are a lot of environmentalists who actually have really praised the agreement for talking about the transition away from fossil fuels for the first time. That is unequivocally a, a shift that is arguably quite meaningful, but it was definitely watered down. And a lot of people also were crushed. And, you know, these, these quotes in the Guardian from climate scientists that they were devastated was the word that I read. So you know, different people had widely divergent reactions to the agreement, even within the environmental and, and, and climate community. Well, I think this is the big challenge when trying to address the climate crisis, the idea that, you know, these oil companies and China in particular are responsible largely for what's happening, and yet they are in the position of power, and any kind of effort to get them to do anything requires basically giving them what they want, which is usually to not change at all. Meanwhile, what ends up happening is like, you know, California will put a ban on gas vehicles by some date and then, you know, poor Americans who can't afford electric cars and can't afford $7 a gallon gas, they're the ones who get screwed. There's a reason that we haven't solved the climate problem. And the uncomfortable fact is it's not only because of the fossil fuel interests. Fossil fuels 
provide serve a function in society and everyone uses them and the availability of cheap and plentiful energy is useful to everybody and it's the lubricant of the economy and so it's a hard problem there is a lot of political skullduggery and actors whose hands are not clean but it's also true that we don't have fully cost-effective and abundant and reliable substitutes. And that's a big part of why we are where we are. There, of course, it's the, the global poor and vulnerable who are suffering the most and will continue to suffer the most from climate impacts. But it's also true that the global poor suffer from energy poverty. And unless we have a readily available affordable substitute, it's a really hard thing to, to look them in the face and say, we're helping you out by, by taking away your energy, right? So we, th these are hard issues and we have a lot of technology and a lot of it is available and that needs to be maximized, but it's not full. We don't have fully substitutable uh, clean options in every sector and for everyone in every part of the world. And that's, um, that's something we have to solve to address the problem.